Well, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Okay, there it is. <laughs> All right. All right. Welcome to our Sunday service. I hope everyone enjoyed the holidays. Uh, it was a good time. Mm -hmm. My team won. No. <laughs> hey, man. That always makes you feel better because the last few years they've been dropping it on Thanksgiving. <laughs> and it kind of ruins the rest of the day for me. I don't know why I don't have any investment in them. <laughs> I don't pay any of the players. <laughs> But it sort of changes my mood when they lose. But amen. It is good to be in the house of the Lord. Lord, I thank you for this morning. I thank you for your spirit going before us. I thank you for your grace and mercy that are new every day. And Lord, I thank you for your faithfulness. And all that we go through and all we've been through, Lord, there's been one constant. And the constant is your love for us. And the constant is your faithfulness in our life, Lord. And we thank you that you are truly a God that sees us cares about us. Now, Lord, we pray for all those that are going through, Lord, those in countries where they're battling just to live, Amen. where they're being bombed daily and where storms and floods and raging. And there's so many things raging around the world, Lord. I thank you that you are faithful and that we live in a land where we are fairly safe, Lord. Amen. We pray for these that are caught in neighborhoods where there's violence every day, and we pray for those that have lost loved ones and those that are suffering from the senseless violence in our nation. Lord, it's become fashionable to kill people you don't know. It's become fashionable just to kill people just because Satan wants you to be his vessel. And Lord, we pray for those people with mental disease and those people with hatred in their heart and those people that are just angry. It just seems like there's so many people in this nation that are just angry. They're angry just to be angry, Lord. They're just, uh, their hand is against everyone, Lord. They're looking for a reason to be angry. And Lord, we pray that they get peace, peace yes, in their spirit, Lord. peace in their soul, peace in their mind, Lord. And we pray that that thing be lifted. And more especially, we pray for their salvation. Yes. Mm -hmm. Lord, we pray that your word go forth in all these things. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 This is the Advent season. Yes. Mm -hmm. My message today is called, When You Pass Through the Fire. Mm -hmm. When You Pass Through the Fire. But this being Advent season, in the truest form, Advent means a notable person, thing, or an event. Something that is an event is an Advent. Amen. Mm -hmm. And then the Advent of television was something that was life changing, and it changed the world. You know, I I can remember uh, when I was stationed in Germany, and Janice and I would write each other. We'd be about a week behind in the letters. Mm -hmm. Because by the time the mail went through the army and went across and all that and got to her and then she got back to me and all that. So it was even worse in World War II and World War III and stuff. You had to wait maybe a month before you found out something. But with the advent of telephones and, and uh, webs, you know, websites and all this, you can talk to people in live time. You can see people in other states and see them mm -hmm. instead of waiting to, you know, get pictures and all that. And so that was really an advent that changed time. So the season of advent in the Christian church, it means the coming of Christ. Amen. And it's actually three advents. They're three different perspectives. It's the physical nativity in Bethlehem, mm -hmm. the, the reception of Christ in the heart of a believer, and the astrological second coming of Christ. Mm -hmm. So that advent needs to be at least three times in your life. You know, first, when you recognize that he did come and was born for your sins Amen. and died for your sins. And then when you allow him to come into your life, that's the second born again of the biggest advent mm -hmm. on this fleshly planet. Amen. And then the third one is this second coming. Mm -hmm. Those of us that believe he's coming again. Mm -hmm. Amen. Those of us that believe when there's so many that don't believe. Mm -hmm. And actually, advent only goes back to about 1839 when a priest named uh, Johann Hendrik Weinhorn, it was a pastor in Germany, and he built a reef out of an old cartwheel to help the children in his mission school count the days until Christmas. And then uh, he had some small candles to be lit every weekday, and Saturday during Advent, he'd use a bigger one. Mm -hmm. You know, as they were trying to, you know, which is his whole concept about it being on a wooden wheel, 
with a, a wreath. Mm -hmm. Might not pass the fire marshal today, <laughs> but at that time he did. He lit candles each time so the children could count them. And now today they have the candles in different com uh, different uh, colors mm -hmm. to mark the four weeks up to Christmas. Mm -hmm. And so each week you add, and it represents a different thing. You know, they've added more and more customs and more and more mm -hmm. things to it. But uh, some churches don't acknowledge it at all. They say it's a Catholic thing. And some people say... It's a, you know, the Protestants don't really get into Advent. I remember when I was in Catholic school, we'd have a little Advent cardboard card they give us. You put a quarter in every day. Mm -hmm. And at the end, they would send it to Catholic charities or Catholic missions. Mm -hmm. And so you, you had this little every day. But in four weeks leading up, you, you were supposed to come up with a quarter or a dime or whatever they came up with. Mm -hmm. And so that made your mind thinking during the holiday season, there are people less fortunate than you. Amen. And they'd have a little picture of the kids needing food and all that, and they'd just show us that visual picture that, think of it as you got your list of everything you want. <laughs> think about there's somebody out there that needs something too. Amen. And it was a good concept. And one of my scriptures today is Isaiah 43.1. Isaiah 43.1 is one of my favorite scriptures, and it says, um, uh, but now, this is what the Lord says. He who created you, Jacob, he who formed you, Israel, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name, and you are mine. And when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. And when you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. You know, that, that, that's, that was one of my yearly scriptures, and that was one of my scriptures that I held on to even back when I was in Calgary, I think, was when I first, in the 90s. And that scripture said, when you pass through, you know, we all go through things. You know, and if you're not going through nothing, then wait a little while, you will be going through something. <laughs> and if you don't know anybody going through nothing, then I don't know where you at or what you're going through. But as you pass through, just remember God is with you. Now, this is the last quarter of 2022. And it has been a time of reflection in my life. It's, it's been said, expect the unexpected. It's something you need to know in life. You can expect the unexpected to happen. And as this year is closing out with 34 days left in 2022, my mind turns to 2023. And my one word coming this year is faithful. Amen. Faithful. Amen. There's times when you think, uh, is it worth it? Or is this my problem? Is this something I really need to deal with? And God tells you, be faithful. Amen. If you're saying like the world is crazy and things going around and people going to work and, you know, I was reading about the Walmart shooting and one of the young people that were killed was 16. Yeah. He just started that job. Mm -hmm. And the man gunned him down. And when he just said he, said he had made his first check the week before and he bought his mom a Christmas gift. Wow. And then they killed him. Mm -hmm. wow. So he may have been angry with the people who been working there with him for 10 years and he felt like everybody wronged him. But there was no reason for him to kill somebody who had only been there a couple weeks. Right. You know, just the insanity of it all. Yeah. And so God is telling you, be faithful. Amen. Though the world looks crazy, you see two-year-old babies being shot, and you see mm -hmm. young people being shot in car seats, and you see people just shot in the head just sitting in their cars or just trying to conduct your daily business. Mm -hmm. You got to look over your shoulder. People trying to take your car or people trying to carjack you and rob you and all that. There's no respect for law anymore. Right. God is telling you, be, be faithful. faithful. Though it looks crazy all around you, be faithful. Mm -hmm. I first started my one word in uh, 2015. My word then was finish. And it was funny because uh, that's when I got sick and had a light little stroke and I finished driving the truck. <laughs> you know? But he gave me the word at the beginning of the year and then later on in July, I realized what he was talking about. That's finished. <laughs> You're not going to drive a truck anymore. Mm -hmm. And then 2016 was resolved as I was going through all these doctor's appointments and neurology and, you know, x-ray and examine and, you know, they had me up on the rack and checked everything. You know, when I went through that, he gave me resolve. And in 2017, he gave me walk. You just got to walk it out. Just keep to some things, you got to walk it out. You know, I like to watch football and somebody get injured or hurt and you see them on the sideline just walking. They keep walking. 
and walk it. They tell them, keep walking and walk it. Then you see them back in the game. Sometimes you just got to walk it out <laughs> when you get back in the game. Let that pain, let that thing you're going through, that thing that's been hindering you, you just got to walk it out. And then in 2018, he gave me faith. Faith. Boy, you think you have faith or you don't know faith? 2018 was the beginning. It was uh, like a faith eve. <laughs> what that was, something like that, you know, faith. So I needed a lot of faith in 2018. There was a lot of things I went through in 2018, and I thought that was a rough year. Then 2019 was shaking. Things were shaking, you know, but uh, it was just, that was another year. And 2020 was greater. <laughs> and I thought that was a prosperous year. 2020 is greater. As I celebrated on New Year's Eve, and oh, greater. The Lord gave me greater. <laughs> then we had a greater pandemic than we ever had. <laughs> but sometimes when the Lord gives you a word, <laughs> you may be feeling it's for this, but God is just telling you what it's going to be. Yeah. It's going to be greater. Greater challenges, greater things. You know, folks just go crazy. I remember putting groceries in the garage because they said let them sit for a day or two to whatever the disease may be on them and washing your cans off and masking up and gloving up and all this before you go. You go to the gas pump and get gas. You had to sanitize. You go through a door, you sanitize. You know, 2020 was a faith builder, mm -hmm. <laughs> if nothing else. 2020. And then 2021 was Passover. I just needed some of this stuff to just pass off. <laughs> just go on. Lord, I've been through these other years. Let, let this year be a year of Passover. And then my word for last year was consecrate. To consecrate. And it means I had to really make some decisions in life last year about my ministry and about different things. You know, when the world says you retire at 65, you get to look at, well, hey, how much longer are we going to do this creature thing, you know? <laughs> I'm hitting retirement age, you know? I got out early on Social Security. Now, now I'm looking at it. All right, Lord, what, what's my retirement day, you know? And he told me, consecrate yourself because you're going to still be here. You know, there, there was things that I wanted to cut out in my life that God wouldn't let me cut them out. There was people I wanted to cut out in my life that God wouldn't let me cut out. And there was things that I wanted to go through that... People, you know, that I was considering dead weight or hindrance in my life. And the Lord said, not yet. You got to consecrate yourself. Get yourself together and make sure you right with me. And don't worry about what these other people are doing. Amen. Consecrate yourself. Amen. It wasn't for me to try to make them consecrate or change them. He said, this is you and me. You get right with me. And I'll take care of the other things. Amen. And then 2023, he's telling me about being faithful. You just got to be faithful sometimes. Sometimes you got to be that person that somebody knows they can call and they know you're going to be faithful. You know, when you think you need a ride somewhere and people say they're going to be there and they don't show up and they start clicking their lights off behind you. <laughs> you stand in that parking lot or where they at. You need somebody that's faithful. You know, somebody said they're going to come give you a jump when it's 20 below and 3 in the morning. Then you got to have a faithful friend. So faithfulness is one of those words that you know, that's one thing I, I, I'm talking to a lot of my nieces and nephews. The one thing that's quality they say they admire in me is that I keep my word. Mm -hmm. That if I tell them something, I'm going to do it. Any of my children learned that over the years. That if I tell you something, it's going to happen. <laughs> you know, I don't change and I don't reflect it. You know, it's funny because my son, Javier, was over for the holidays. And he's talking about all the stuff he got away with that I didn't know. And I guess since the statue, the statue of limits was up. So, <laughs> and then he, he told Jaria we was on a cruise and he took her car and was gone for all the while we was on a cruise. He said he went to Bolingbrook and he went all over there and he just got his license. But he was, you know, all the confessions were coming out. <laughs> but, you know, be faithful. The Lord will tell you what they did to you. <laughs> it may be years down the road, but the Lord will make them come back and tell you. You know, just be faithful. You know, it's just funny when you get around, you know, I remember kids telling me when they first drank wine and all that stuff with little cousins that I trusted them with, and they let them babysit and give them wine. And they know I would have went off. <laughs> but, you know, they waited till they were grown and had their own families before they gave me that story. <laughs> you know? So I'm just saying, but be faithful. God will reveal. Amen. Amen. And then Exodus 34, 5. It says, then the Lord came down in a cloud and stood there with him and proclaimed his name, the Lord. 
and he passed in front of Moses proclaiming the Lord. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in love and faithfulness. Amen. Now the backstory on that was Moses had broken the Ten Commandments. Mm -hmm. And so him and God had to meet again. <laughs> you know, the thing about it is sometimes, you know, you have to receive a second dose from God. And God allowed Moses in his anger to break the first tablets. But when he came back, he gave him a second chance. Mm -hmm. And see, some people don't realize that God gives second chances. Yes. Some people don't realize that God moves on. You know, some people I've been talking to, dealing with family, and some of them are just stuck. They stuck in things that happened in their life. They stuck in what somebody did to them. They're bringing up stuff that happened 40, 50 years ago. And it's been something that just froze you in your life. And they want to bring up arguments that people who live don't even live no more. People that are dead, you want to bring up confusion from the past because you stuck in the past. But God gives second chances. Amen. When he told Moses, come back this time, I'm going to give you the tablets. But the difference being, he had Moses right out there. Mm -hmm. The first tablets were written with God's hand. And they said, you didn't accept the perfect. Mm -hmm. Since you won't do things your way, then you sit here and chisel out these tablets mm -hmm. your way. We're going to let you do it your way. God will let you do it your way, even though he has a more perfect way. Yes. We may not accept his perfect way, but he will let you do it your way. You know? And so, when it says when you pass through, that implies that you're going to make it through to the other side. Amen. When the scripture tells you, when you pass through, I will be with you. Mm -hmm. That implies that there's an ending on the other side. Because mm -hmm. there's no need telling me when I pass through, if I'm going to drown midway. When you get in the water, it's over. <laughs> when you get in the fire, it's over. But he tells you, when you pass through, yeah. when you go through this season you're going Amen. through, when Amen. you're going through this season of doubt, you're going through this season of questioning, you're going through this season of why me, or when you're going through, yes. God tells you, when you pass through, mm -hmm. when it hits your spirit, when it hits your mind, when it hits your revelation, that you have passed through. Amen. When you get to the other side and start to celebrate, and you see the things that you've been going through and the people that have been antagonizing you, the things that have been a problem in your life. But once you pass through, yes, you'll see God is with you. Amen. The key is you got to pass through. Yes, you, you can't go around it. You can't accept it Amen. any other way. Amen. It's funny. Uh, Janice and I were watching the Alaska, the last frontier, and I didn't watch it in a year. But when I had my eye surgery and I was sitting around, it started in 2011. And <laughs> uh, Dre and and Joni were pregnant, and we were all off at the same time. So we got to watch the Alaska State Troopers, the Alaska Last Frontier, and we got to watch all these shows. But to see it years later, this last season was this closing season. And the older brothers, one was one is uh, 74, and the other one, one was born in 52, and one was born in 47. So they up there now. And they both got injured, and they both got hurt. One was a cowboy and did all the stuff, and he, do, he can't do it anymore. He tried to get on a horse after he fell. A cow rolled over him, broke all his bones. And then he recovered a couple of months, six months later. And he got back on the horse. And you could hear with every footstep of the horse, ow, ow. And then they were bleeping him. <laughs> yeah. And he realized, though he wanted to continue to be a cowboy, that door had closed. And they kept asking different sons that they want to take over the cattle. And him and his wife had to realize that's past. Nobody wants to be herding cows you know? <laughs> so, so they realized he said well, you know what I'm thinking about going down to Michigan and buy an ambulance and let's start traveling I'm going to convert this ambulance and we're going to make it into a camper and, you know so he started having another plan that his dream wasn't his children's dream his lifestyle wasn't you know the father passed it on to him but that next generation didn't want to be sliding up down icy hills fighting cows <laughs> they, they wanted a different way and then as you see the changing from one generation to the other you know I just this year has been a really a reflective year for me as I see one generation releasing things to the next generation you know each generation wonders if the generation coming after them will get it right and each one wonders uh, have you taught them enough have you instilled in them enough but the one son that wanted to keep on the traditions of his grandfather he was able to build things do things and all this and he was keeping on that tradition but he had parts of a vision he didn't want so you got to realize your vision and your dream may not be what your children want. Yes, but God is going to make it work out that they're going to be all right. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and it's, just as I've been dealing with these people with bitter roots in their life, you know, 
Sometimes bitter roots need pulling up. You just got to pull them up by the root. Because if you don't take the root out, they will come back. And I found that those that don't have a relationship with God, is really, I can see the difference. Those that know God, they understand. They give you that little nod. <laughs> when they see you going through, or they may give you that little touch on the hand when they're going by. Because they've been through that. They understand that. But those without hope, they just want to cling to everything that can they can hold on to. Things that have passed, seasons that have passed. And you got to realize when you have a relationship with God, don't even worry about it. God has you covered. Amen. And some of them saints are on a slippery slope of damnation because they don't have forgiveness. Some folks that go to church every week don't have forgiveness. People write you off and write you out of their life. And they're supposed to be saints. You know, we may disagree, but you know, that's one thing in my family, the sons have always looked at the, the, the sisters and said, you know, they always fall out with each other for years. You know, they were good speaking for generations on my sister's side. But me and my brothers, we may have had a fist fight here and there. We may have had a disagreement, but we were able to, the same day of a good fight, go out drinking. <laughs> you know, nobody, nobody held a grudge. I never fell out with any of my brothers or my sisters. But some of them fell out with me, but I never fell out with another. But as I see the difference between the males and the females, you know, you got a problem with me, we gonna voice this right now, we gonna work through it. But the females, woo, they have their praise and worship leaders and got somebody they ain't spoke to for years in their own family. But they all falling out and getting the spirit and all that. <laughs> you know, God is saying there's something here between me and you. That unforgiveness for somebody else. Amen. Now, forgiveness doesn't mean that they can walk on you. It doesn't mean that they've got over on you. It means I let it go. You just got to let some things go. Life is too short. And my text today is from Daniel chapter 3. It took me a while to get there, but we were getting there. And thank God for the heat. It's really heat up here. <laughs> thank God for the tape slowing the heat down. <laughs> In Daniel 3, 1, King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold, 60 cubits high and 6 cubits wide, and set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. He then summoned the satraps, the perfects, the governors, the advisors, the treasurers, the judge, the magistrates, and all the other provincial, provincial officials to come to the dedication of the image he had set up. So the satraps, the perfects, the governors, the advisors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, and all the other pro providential officials assembled for the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And they stood before it. Then the herald loudly proclaimed, Nations and people of every language, this is what you are commanded to do. Now, this, this representative of Nebuchadnezzar was speaking for Nebuchadnezzar. And he proclaimed, this is what you're supposed to do. As soon as you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the zire, the lyre, the harp, the pipe, and all kinds of music, you must fall down and worship the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. Whoever does not fall down and worship will immediately be thrown into a blazing furnace. Wow. So the law is established. When you hear the music and the flutes and stuff as it's coming towards you, I, I kind of picture like a Mardi Gras coming down the street. You know, Mardi Gras, they show them all coming and the band is coming and all of a sudden and everybody's worshiping and stuff, but we're working our way to this big image of the king, Nebuchadnezzar. And as we get closer and closer, everybody's supposed to be partying. You're supposed to celebrate the king whether you can't stand him or not. If you don't think he's a good king, that has nothing to do with today. Everybody's going to worship this king we all love. And so, if not, we got a fiery furnace already ready. Therefore, as soon as they heard the sound of the horn, the flute, the zero, the lair, the harp and all kinds of music and all the nations and the people of every language fell down and worshiped the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And at this time, some of the astrologers came forward and denounced the Jews. They said to King Nebuchadnezzar, may you live forever. See, I always beware of flattering tongues. They usually got a request behind them. Oh, you're, like, you're the greatest and you the best. You know, some people my family, they, they like to say, Who's their favorite act? And who's their favorite uncle? 
Are you my favorite brother? Are you my favorite cousin? And I always tell them, look out for that favorite. Because it takes a while to be the favorite. You, you got to be there when they call. If you want to hold that title and be in that position when they call you and you're the favorite, then they expect you to come. Whenever they hear the music and the lyric and the flows and all that, and the sound of the friend, when you hear the trumpets going off and whatever, and they call it, you hear that ringtone, you the favorite sister, you the favorite aunt, you the favorite cousin. They expected you to bow down. So, you know, I'm just telling you, people always want to tell you, you their favorite. And I'm telling you, I don't, I'm not looking for the title. Because there's work involved with being the favorite. You know, we can just get along. We don't have to be the favorite. But those flattering tongues, may you live forever, kid. Come here and compliment me. But we got an issue we need to discuss. That's why, you know, when I first started pastoring, people always wanted to take me to lunch. Pastor, can I go take you, take you to lunch? And then I realized each lunch came with a problem. Wow. Each lunch came with an issue. You know, so-and-so is doing this, and so-and-so has said that. The lunches were never free. <laughs> the lunches always came. You need to tell so-and-so this, and you need to correct this or that. You know, they, they try to, you know, feed me and get me to go their way. Mm -hmm. I got to the place where I had to realize, you know, I got lunch money. You know, I don't have to go to lunch with you. You know, and then someone wanted me to, you know, excommunicate people or take positions from them. And I tell them, well, you know, are you going to do what it says in Matthew 18 and be a witness against them? Oh, no, no, that's your job. But the Bible says I need a witness. You said you've seen them do this and that. Now are you willing to, no, no, no. They want to run away. So, you know, be careful of them flattering people. He says, verse 10, your majesty has issued a decree that everyone who hears the sound of the horn, the flute, the zara, the lyre, the harp, the pipe, and all kinds of music must bow down and worship the image of God. And that whoever does not fall down and worship will be thrown into a blazing furnace. But there are some Jews whom you have set over the affairs of the providence of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who pay no attention to your majesty, they need to serve your gods nor worship your image of gold you have set up. Now, mm. Wow, they come in with this compliment. Now, let me tell you, we worship you. We love you. But there's some people say you ain't worth it. There's some people saying you can't win. There's some people saying you don't deserve worship. You see people that get upset when they used to everybody worshiping them, and you stop worshiping them, and they get angry. And I was reading this article the other day where uh, Kanye went to dinner with Trump. And he told Trump that he wants him to be his running mate. That Kanye wanted to be the top of the ticket and he wanted Trump to be vice president. <laughs> <laughs> so you can find out. <laughs> it said, Trump went off. <laughs> he cussed Kanye out. And little Freddie brought whatever he put him all. He finished the lunch and it was over. You know, because Trump got upset that Kanye said he was greater than Trump. Wow. That he could win and Trump couldn't. So, you know, I'm just saying, you know, when they come to flatter you, they come with you. Now, there's, there's these Jews over here that's not listening to you. Mm -hmm. These these people over here that don't think, don't believe what you believe. Mm -hmm. And that was the whole thing with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They didn't pay no attention to who the great one was. Mm -hmm. So furious with rage, Nebuchadnezzar summoned Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So these men were brought before the king. And Nebuchadnezzar said to them, is it true? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the image of gold I set up? Now, when you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the zither, the lyre, the harp, the pipe, and all kinds of music, if you are ready to fall down and worship the image I made, very good. But if you do not worship it, you will be thrown immediately into a blazing furnace. Then what God will be able to rescue you out of my hand. All right, now we king is getting deep. I'm giving you one more chance to get on my side. You know, it, it was like when the Crusaders were going across conquering all these lands for the church, and they gave the Indians a choice, and you know, the Mexicans and the Aztecs, either join our religion or we're going to cut your head off. So they had a lot of converts to Catholicism. They surely had what they did with King. King Arthur and the knights and all that, the crusades they had. When they went through Palestine Palestine and all these countries, they gave them a choice, become Catholic or die. Mm. 
So this is sort of like, sort of like this, what he was saying. Either be a part of my religion, worship my gods, and worship me too, or you're going to be put to death. And the Jews were always taught from the beginning there's only one God. We only worship the one true living God. So they couldn't, they, you know, they, they, they were willing to die for their faith. There's so many people today, boy, if we were called on to die for God, how many of you become atheists? <laughs> how many of you say, Lord, let me get out of this situation? And, and then once I tell them I'm an atheist and they let me go, then I'll repent. Mm -hmm. You know? What, what did Satan tell them? Skin for skin. Let me touch Job's skin and we, we'll get him to break down then. Mm -hmm. A lot of people, when it comes down to skin, to skin. You know? Hmm. <laughs> wow, is it? Nebuchadnezzar suffered from it's all about me syndrome. Mm -hmm. There are people who cannot live life because they're trying to protect their own little world. Mm -hmm. There are people more in love with man made rules over God's rules. Mm -hmm. There are more people upset with the rules of the church, mm -hmm. the rules of our faith, the rules of our family, rules over God's rules. And when those rules come into conflict with God's rules, mm -hmm. then you're getting in the wrong place. Mm -hmm. And people want to be so quick to point out the rules where you miss it. There are whole ministries built on telling people how they're wrong. There are whole ministries that their whole focus is to tell people. There was a man called the Bible Answer Man. <laughs> he had a radio show telling everybody where they're wrong. And he dispute everybody. Everybody was a heretic. Everybody's hell is headed to hell. Everybody's not doing it right. And there are people that you listen to them all the time. John MacArthur, all these people, they steady want to correct you, tell you the right way, do it our way. But these same people will accept some of the most ungodliest people into their fold and call them a part of them. These same people will, will take people that are, you know, liars, divorcees, all these things they're not, you know, that they're against. But they'll accept him because he's our liar. He's our divorcee. And they will follow him. And they set up these little Christian organizations that are conservative. Conservative today is just more or less meant to be angry. If you're conservative, you're mad at everybody. That don't believe what you believe. Everybody that don't say what you say. Everybody that doesn't fall in line when they hear the sound of the music. They hear the sound of the, the flute. They hear the sound of the drum. They, they're not falling in line. Then all of a sudden, your organization is against them. Be careful of people that want to try to protect their world. And that's what Nebuchadnezzar, he had that. It's all about me syndrome. There's a lot of people battling that. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, we did not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, then God, the God we serve, is able to deliver us from it. And he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you set up. Wow. All right. This is it here. To his face. You know, you're dealing with somebody that had the power to say you did. Mm -hmm. And you were dead. In the book of Esther, when uh, he was trying to molest Esther and beg her to save his life, mm -hmm. they said they put a, 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 a cloth over his head and drug him out the king's presence. Mm -hmm. And the king turned his back on his best friend. Haman was his boy. He, you know, he, he had his seal. He had his reign to conduct business of it. And then when it got down to him or Esther, it said the king turned his back. Yeah. And they took him away from his presence. Yeah. He said they, they, in the big gallows he built to hang all these Jews on, they hung him, his family, and all his friends that was with him. Yeah. So you got to be careful when you come up against God. Mm -hmm. You know, he said, but the thing he said, if God doesn't work it out the way I want it to. Mm -hmm. You know, people all the time tell me how they prayed for this and they prayed for that and they got a word for the Lord. I was looking at uh, the last candidate for governor, Bailey, said him and his wife prayed and fast and the Lord told him he would be governor. So who's wrong? Was God wrong? Did he miss it? <laughs> they prayed. They fast. They were going to turn Illinois back to a godly state. And they were going to do this and do that. And the Lord had gave them a, 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 a commandment, a, a mandate. So when it didn't happen, who was it? <laughs> was God wrong? Or was Bailey wrong? You got this foolish woman down in Arizona, Carrie Lake, talking about she still won. But she didn't win. You know, it's like 
If you ever seen a movie like Rocky, when he got beat down at the end and Sylvester Stallone's face was all bloody and he couldn't see and his eyes were closed up and he said, I won, I won. You know, Apollo Creed had beat him down. But he said he won because he didn't knock me out. Okay, you can take your victory wherever you get it, but technically he didn't have a belt. He didn't have a crown. He won because he didn't knock me out. And that's sort of the way this is. You know, sometimes people still saying they won. I remember all these predictions I was seeing on the internet about how Trump was going to win and Paula White was calling uh, angels from Africa to come and support Trump. And I'm like, isn't that one of the countries that Trump said were the asshole countries? So why are you calling African angels for Trump? That's the people he's borrowing from the country. They couldn't get in anyway under Trump's law. But you know, then I'm looking at these other ones praying. You know, They all laid out, 700 Club, everybody. Trump's going to win because God is with him. Then he didn't win. Now we got to change all the voting rules. All those votes are wrong. People that voted by mail telling you it's not right. Trump, you know, they all voted by mail. And then they're going to turn around and say, don't trust it. Well, why is it good enough for you? And it's not good enough for me. So I'm just saying, baby, they told them if God doesn't work it out the way you want it, if that plan you had, that vision you had, you may have been riding into the sunset with a mate forever and it didn't work out or God called them home early. Things that you planned that they were going to be there to see your children and box your children and it didn't work out that way. God is still in control. Yes, amen. And Shadrach and Abednego, Abednego they knew mm -hmm. that if it doesn't work out yeah. the way I thought it would, yeah. if it doesn't work, you know, I, I was fully convinced by the time I was 25, I was going to be rich. Nobody could have told me as a 20, 21 year. I didn't know how I was going to do it, but I just was assured. And then by 30, there's no way I'd still be working after 30. <laughs> when I was 19, 30 looked like, oh. <laughs> me, me and my father-in-law went out there to Thanksgiving holiday and had a couple of beverages. And I kept calling him old man. Hey, old? Who you call old? You old man. <laughs> Next day, I knew he leaped towards me, and we got to wrestling. And he was more drunk than I was, and he kept falling and stuff. And I, and I brought him back a little scarred up. Jan said, well, what you doing about that? <laughs> I thought, I didn't touch your dick, <laughs> which I did. I just I stepped and gave him a little push. <laughs> but, but, but then when I look back, he was only 40. At that time, I thought he was a really old man. <laughs> Now at 65, look at him at 40. <laughs> when I thought he was an old man. <laughs> you know, God will give you perspective. Yeah. I'm just saying. Wow. And that just blew my mind. I thought about that years later. I just was convinced at 40 he was old. But it just didn't work out like I planned. I was going to, you know, I had a plan. I was going to make this thing work. But oh, he said, that's all right. The God we serve, if it happens, it does. If it doesn't happen, we still good. Amen. Then Nebuchadnezzar was furious. You know, with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And his attitude towards them changed. He ordered the furnace heated seven times hotter than usual. See, when you stand for God, people's attitudes towards you will change. Right. Yes. Yeah. You know, it's funny, one of the things uh, my daughters are saying on weekend is how we used to always make them clean up the house in case somebody coming by. And she said, nobody ever came by. I thought, well, that's all right. We had it clean in case somebody came by. <laughs> but the thing about it, the cars over there, but all the people that used to come and play cards and drink with me and stuff before I got saved, they quit coming by. And that's what happened. When you start to serve the Lord, the people coming with another thing, they don't come by no more. You know, so just think about it. When you choose God, people's attitudes towards you change. And you say you're going to stand on the word. And they cut you out. First Samuel 8, 7 says, And the Lord told him, Listen to all that the people are saying to you. It's not you they have rejected, but they have rejected me as the king. Mm -hmm. So don't take it personal. They're not rejecting you. They're rejecting the God in you. And then verse 20, And, and command some of the strongest soldiers in his army to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and throw them in the blazing furnace. So these men wearing their robes, their trousers, their turbans, and other clothes were bound and thrown into the blazing furnace. And the king's command was so urgent that the furnace was so hot that the flames of fire killed the soldiers who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, firmly tied, fell into the blazing furnace. Wow. 
So this fire was seven times hotter than it ever been. Mm. It was so hot that the people went to throw him in and it burned him up being that close. Mm -hmm. And then they just fell in fully bound and everything else into the fire. Mm -hmm. See, God can burn up any hindrance in your life. Mm -hmm. No matter how hot the flames get, sometimes the persecution seems hot. Sometimes the lies seem hot. Sometimes the people seem like everybody's against you. Sometimes nobody, you can't find a friend. You can't buy a friend or rent a friend. But God is still with you. Amen. I'm going to tell you. Then King Nebuchadnezzar leaped to his feet in amazement and asked his advisor, weren't there three men that we tied up and threw into the fire? They replied, certainly, your majesty. He said, look, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound, unharmed, and the fourth looks like a son of the God. I tell somebody. somebody, God is always in your fiery furnace. Keep your faith. Keep your faith. Amen. When I was a child, one of my favorite people was a guy called Adam Clayton Powell, Jr. And he was a senator, and he was uh, from New York, and he was a slick preacher. Hair always slicked back, you know. And he was a good Baptist preacher. He was always in the club, partying and drinking. You see him in the jet, he'd have his cigarette, and Adam Clayton Powell was he was a dynamic person, one of the best speakers, like Martin Luther King level. He had that oratory talent. And, but his favorite thing was keep the faith, baby. Yeah. <laughs> whatever, whatever they told him or something or said something to him, he said, keep the faith, baby. Mm -hmm. And that was his quote. But, but what, you know, they ran him out of Congress. They tried to get all these different things to him. Well, he was a, a, a state senator. I mean, a, a, you know, the ones that elected every two years, not the state senator. But anyway, when he lost, and uh, he, it, but the thing about Adam Clayton Powell, I remember seeing him in the Bahamas. He had one of the big fishing boats that he owned, and he had a big pole. He's catching swordfish and stuff, and they were showing him in the ebony. They were showing him with sitting up under these thatch huts with his little mixed drinks and everything. They asked him how his life after Congress. He said, "Keep the faith, baby." <laughs> that's all he, said. he was enjoying his life to the end. He just told him, "Keep the faith, baby." You know, and that's what you got to do. You got to keep the faith, baby. So then Nebuchadnezzar approached the opening of the blazing furnace and shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out and come here. So he's still giving them order. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the fire, and the Shabstraks and the perfects and the governors and the royals and the advisors crowded around them, and they saw that the fire had not harmed their bodies. Not a hair of their head was singed. Their robes were not scorched, and there was no smell of fire on them. See, what you've been through, mm -hmm. some folks won't recognize it. Because mm -hmm. you ain't got no singed clothes, you ain't got no smelly smell of smoke. You know, people don't know what you've been through. Right. People don't know. You know, you may be looking good, smelling good, standing there, pocket full of money. People don't know what you went through. Yeah. People don't know it's a miracle that you are still here. Right. People don't know that you done flatlined and all this other stuff. They don't know what you've been through. Right. They don't know that you fought cancer. They don't know that you done fought this and you done fought that right. or whatever. They don't know what you've been through. Amen. You may have been through a deep hurt. You may have been through a deep disappointment, but people don't know. Mm -hmm. And he said when they were standing there, nobody could see any evidence of yeah. what they went through. Yeah. And when you are in God, nobody will see the evidence of what you went through, but you know that God took you through it. God brought you through it. God brought you through it. And that's what I was, you know, I was just studying this morning, thinking about, oh, you don't know what I've been through. But God brought me through it. The fact that he told me he's going to be with me, the fact that he brought me through what he brought me through. You know, I, I deal with some people that in vanity, they don't want to use a cane when they stumble when they walk. I think you're walking. You know, you don't want to use a walker. you walking. There are people that would be glad to have a walker, yeah. glad to have a cane. Yeah. If they can get out of a chair that they're confined to and walk, yes. Amen. you know, people, t you know, sometimes vanity, it just, it cuts you off. Amen. I'm glad to be moving. Yes. You know, I am, really. You know, I mean, all the years I took pride in my hair and the ways and stuff, and they all gone now. I've adjusted. <laughs> I'm saying. Now I just hey, a little Vaseline on top and I'm out the door. <laughs> Keep and get an ashy scalp, I'm good. <laughs> you know, I don't have to trim a beard or none of that no more. Mustache is perfect. It's gone. <laughs> so I'm just saying, but you learn to adjust. Amen. You learn to adjust. Amen. You know, I'm just saying, boy, you just don't know. Mm -hmm. Then Nebuchadnezzar said, 
Praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and rescued his servants. They trusted in him and defied the king's commandments and were willing to give up their lives rather than serve or worship any god except their own. So the king had an attitude adjustment. It wasn't all about him. He was the most powerful, mightiest man in the land. And he seen all of his best efforts. Couldn't touch the real God. Amen. He said, therefore, I decree that the people of any nation or language who say anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be cut into pieces. Their house is to be turned into a pile of rubble. And no other God can save in this way. Amen. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the providence of Babylon. <laughs> people don't realize yeah, yeah, yeah. people that had that job you want did all of a sudden you got that job yeah. God promoted you yeah. because you were faithful yeah. you know people tell you come around I thought this was yours I thought you was going to get that no no you just pushed me into my blessing yeah. because I remained faithful I didn't focus yeah. on what you had and what you didn't have yeah. but when I focus on what God has for me and what God has proclaimed yeah. for me then I ain't worried about these yeah. other things yeah. when you trust God they got promoted. Yes. You got promoted after the fire. Yes. They didn't get the promotion before the fire. They didn't get the promotion in the middle of the fire. They got the promotion after they came out the fire. Yes. Yes. And they still walking around in the fire with such an anointing on the king and tell them, y'all come out of my fire. You're making fun of my punishment. You're making fun of what I'm doing. That fire is supposed to be destroying you. You letting people say that they can be in the fire if they got a God that's with them. You letting people say your God is powerful enough to keep you no matter what the fire is. And when they see you rejoicing when they cry and they see you holding up when they losing it and falling all apart because God is in the fire with you. He's in the fire with you. And when he chooses, he'll tell you to come on out. He ain't hurrying out the fire. He ain't trying to, like the people walking on coals as fast as they can. They in the fire walking around. Yeah. Fully clothed. Yes. Amen. Ain't nothing caught on fire. Mm -mm. So I'm just saying, huh? Wow. Mm. Oh, wow. Oh, man. It's truly sad to see God dealing with people that try to hinder, hinder his kingdom on earth. Mm -hmm. See people, boy, declaring that, you know, God is not real. This is not. People, you know, the Bible says in Revelation that in the end times they will still curse mm -hmm. God. Even, even as they're being condemned and consumed, they're going to shake their fists and still curse God. That's a hard heart. Mm -hmm. When you're going through and you still don't see, there's people whose lives are so screwed up and they still don't see it. Mm -hmm. You know? Stop fighting God. Mm -hmm. Let God be God. Amen. Amen. My first point. God allows you to make mistakes. Mm -hmm. Humans are unforgiving and spiteful. Mm -hmm. God will forgive you. Yes. As long as you're in flesh and blood, there's nothing you can do to separate you from the love of God. Mm -hmm. Amen. You know, just think of nothing. We all make mistakes. Nobody's perfect. Yes, right. and if you get to put somebody on a pedestal, just follow them a little longer. Mm -hmm. Keep looking a little closer. Yeah. And these people that want to specialize in finding your dirt, Speaking about your dirt. Keep looking for them. Psalms 37 says, I look for the wicked and they were not there. Mm -hmm. I look for the people that used to hate on me and they're not there. Mm -hmm. You look for the people that talked about you. <coughs> yes. They're not there. The people thought they, they had it together. They're going to be there when you're not. Mm -hmm. You know, some of the people, I remember all the old players and stuff around the streets in Aurora when I was growing up and they all of them ended up pushing carts and Trying to make it, you know, but these were the ones with all the fancy clothes and all the money and the Cadillacs and all that. And you see them later on in life yeah. and they're struggling. They have to hess it out. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, they, they used to pay people to watch their car and wash their car. Mm -hmm. Little boys in the neighborhood and give them money to make them look up to them. Mm -hmm. And now they're struggling. Mm -hmm. Those that are alive. So I'm just saying, God allows you to make mistakes. <coughs> you know, human beings that won't let it go. I just can't forgive them. <laughs> You're blocking your own blessing. They got to come to me first. <coughs> no. No, that's not the Christian way. Surrender. Let it go. Let go and let God. Amen. Something like that. And my second point, do you love a cause more than a creator? <coughs> An organization more than the original organizer? Mm -hmm. See, you know, some people are so, more, they're so committed 
to what they've learned and uh -huh. what they studied. You know, I was reading this article the other day. Somebody was talking about a Crawford Laritz. Laritz, one of my favorite pastors. They're talking about he doesn't have an earned degree. This man has wrote like 80 books. <coughs> you know, he's been pastoring over 50 years. And they're going to say that he's not really a doctor. Because he ain't got a doctorate degree from us. But does he have one from God? The man had a successful church with over 20,000 members. There's a lot of people that believe that he didn't need a degree. You know, and then you see people, you know, they get caught up on this. Because you weren't sanctioned with us. You didn't come out from us. You weren't approved from us. But if you look at Paul and the other apostles, Paul wasn't a part of their group. Paul wasn't what, he wasn't caught up in what they were caught up. He wasn't worried about whether he could eat pork. He wasn't worried about all these other things. Paul was out there witnessing to the people that they would not even talk to. God had to take Peter up on the roof and give him a vision. Yes, amen. Let that old stuff go. Let them old, you know, there's some people more committed to what they think is right than what the Spirit tells them is right. Honor God. Amen. Then you look back through the Ten Commandments and he said, you know, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. Mm -hmm. You should have no other gods before me. Right. Nothing before God. Yes. You know, you should not make for yourself an image in the form of anything. In heaven above or the earth beneath and the waters below. Mm -hmm. You should not bow down to them or worship them. For I am the Lord your God and a jealous God. Yes. Punishing the children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. But showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. Amen. You know, people get upset about crosses and stuff like that. Man, tell me, how come you ain't got a cross on your church? Well, God knows what it is. <laughs> Do I have to have a cross to show that God is here? Do I have to have a cross around my neck to show that I believe in God? But people get caught up on images made by man. Like I used to tell people, if he, if he was shot with a 38, would you have a little pistol around your neck? That was the means of his death. That when the snake was lifted up on the pole, it came a generation later, started worshiping the pole mm -hmm. and the snake. They didn't worship the healing that came with it, and it became their God. So be careful of these little images of people, you know, man-made things. No image. Remember when I was in the Catholic school and all the little statues around, the statue for this saint, and the statue, and the thing, the, the statues just scared me because the church was lit by candles. You know, and a lot of that stuff was candle lit. And you go in there by yourself into the church and ain't nobody around. And you see all these little spooky things, you know. And I used to watch creature features. <laughs> it was like a little scary. <laughs> Somebody in my generation know what I'm talking about. <laughs> but they turn off all the lights and turn on in the room. And I was stupid enough to do that every week. Turn the lights off and sit down. You know? And all of a sudden these creeping shows would come on. You get scared. Ah! <laughs> but it was like that when you walk into church and all these candle lit. And they all had blood and and, and uh, dried on their face and they had scars and nail holes and you know the statues was really freaky mm -hmm. and the Lord said don't make any image <laughs> wow but they got him everywhere he said you don't bow down and worship them he sure you hate the generation you should not misuse my name the name of the Lord your God and hold out anyone I would not hold anyone guiltless who misuses my name God said respect his name. Amen. All right now. He don't play games about his name. He said, remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Boy, six days you should labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath. The Lord your God, and on it you shall not do any work, neither you, nor your son, your daughter, nor your male, your female servant, nor your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your town. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. And he rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Yes, amen. You know, we in a society now where everybody's got to work when you can. But God has said, you should have a Sabbath day. So if it ain't Sunday, you need to have a day of rest. You can't do everything for everybody. The day is not as important as the concept. The concept is rest. Have a day that you just relax, recharge. You know, but some people now they got to keep going till they drop. Mm -hmm. Honor your father and your mother so that they may so you may live long in the land your Lord your God is giving you. Mm -hmm. It says another place, this is a commandment with a promise. Because mm -hmm. if you don't honor your parents, your life will be short. Yes. You should not murder. You should not commit adultery. Mm -hmm. 
You should not steal. You should not give false testimony against your neighbor. Oh, that's a, that's a good one there. False testimony. Don't be lying on folks. <laughs> Let me give you an updated version. Don't be lying on folks. Don't be lying about folks. And don't be lying to folks. <laughs> you know, and that's basically what he's saying. Don't give no false testimony. I remember one time I was taking a lie detector test and they were asking me different questions. And the guy kept asking me the same question over and over. I kept telling them the same lie. So I guess the machine was right. <laughs> but I kept lying to that man over and over. Looked him dead in the face. Nope. Nope. I love him <laughs> And he kept saying, are you sure? And let me rephrase it this way. And he rephrased it this way. Nope. 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 <laughs> you know? And I knew I was lying. And I guess that machine knew I was lying. But I wasn't going to admit it. <laughs> I don't care what he said. But watch out for them false testimonies. Some people are ready to go down with the ship. I ain't going to tell you. <laughs> So you should not cover your neighbor's house. You should not cover your neighbor's wife or his male servant or his ox or his donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Don't be wanting other folks stuff. You can want something like theirs, but don't want theirs. That's what he said. You know, you got a nice car. I want a car like yours, but I don't want your car. That's what he said. You got a nice wife. I want a wife like yours. I don't want your wife. You know, that's what he said. Here, you know, but some people get into covetousness. They want your job, your title, your position. Mm -hmm. No, God will promote me in his own time. Amen. Right. It said when the people saw the thunder and lightning and heard the trumpet and saw the mountains and smoke and they trembled with fear and they stayed at a distance. See, that's the problem with most people in the church today. They stay at a distance from God. Mm -hmm. They don't want to be no fanatic. They don't want to get too crazy. They want to just, let's, let's set this legend aside for a minute so I can tell you what I got to say. <laughs> you know, I'm still saved, but let's, let's keep it real. Mono, mono, real world. Let me tell you what it's really about. You know, you think I'm a Christian, but I ain't no punk. Let me, let me, let me, let me tell you, you know, that, that's what they want to come to you at, you know? And say, no, no, don't, don't, don't think because I carry a Bible, I won't knock you out. You know? See, that's when they want to get real. Say, he told Peter to have a sword. So then he said, and they said to Moses, speak, speak to us yourself and we will listen. But do not have God speak to us or we would die. They heard his voice. Well, that's enough for that. Okay, Moses, you be our interpreter. God selected you before we left Egypt. Let's get back to the original plan. Anything God got to say, tell him to tell you. We don't want to hear that voice again. <laughs> and Moses said to the people, do not be afraid. God has come to test you so that the fear of God will be with you and keep you from sinning. So that he saw God and heard the voice. They heard that so they would let him know, I'm for real. And the people remained at a distance while Moses approached the thick darkness where God was. See, there's some folks that's always going to be at a distance from God. They never going to get more involved. They're never going to get any deeper. They're just going to be keep God right here. These couple of hours on Sunday is yours. The rest of the week, leave me alone, God. I didn't read my Bible. I didn't pray. I didn't have time, you know, but on Sunday. But Daryl Coley said, early Sunday. <laughs> You ought to come in there and worship the Lord. Huh? You keep God at a distance. How much of your time does God really have? That's a question only you could ask. Now, those of you that make resolutions, you know, I gave that up years ago because they just resolved to fail. I just try to do that. But those of you that make a resolution, some of y'all going to resolve to pray more. Some of y'all going to resolve to uh, read more. Some of you going to resolve not to cuss out as many people. So, some of y'all going to try to have these little limits. You know, but don't be like the diets we begin at the beginning of the year. And they say the beginning of the year is the worst time to open a restaurant because everybody's on a diet the first two or three weeks. But by February, you can open up because most of them don't let it go. <laughs> you know, so that, that's a fact. You know, by February, that's over. <laughs> you know? They're tired of eating Weight Watchers and all that. <laughs> They're ready for the real food. Amen. My last point look for the one in the fire with you. He burns off the unnecess unnecessary thing. Mm -hmm. So look for the ones that have been in the fire with you. Amen. Those that have stood with you, those that have been with you. Look for the ones that know it can get hot, but we're going to make it through. Yes. It can get a little heated, but we're going to be all right. Look for the people that know God. Mm -hmm. Look for the people that understand God and understand God's way. Amen. Just look for those that are in the fire. Amen. People that are 
fireproof. Amen. 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 God bless you. That concludes my message this morning. Amen. But you need fireproof people around you. Amen. Amen. People that can take some heat. Uh -huh. You know? Lord, I thank you for this morning. I thank you for your grace and mercy. Now, Lord, we just pray that uh, anybody that's hearing my voice today, that uh, you just let them know that as simply as a prayer, A, to admit they're a sinner, B, to believe that you died for them, and C, to confess you as Lord and Savior. May they get into a Bible-believing church, and may they find the truth, of really, of this whole season, that you are the reason for the season. And Lord, I thank you for your faithfulness in all things, that you've been with us from generation to generation. Amen. We know our God is a real God, and I thank you for your faithfulness. And no matter what fire we're going through or what fire we're going to, we know we're going to make it through because our God is with us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Remember, living and leaving a legacy is what it's all about. Let them talk about you generations after you go. There's some folks in your family that are still talked about. Every time they bring them up, there's a smile. Oh, you remember so and so? <laughs> you know, they're famous in your family. Let, they, let that person be you. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Amen.